I am Dave Canfield. Welcome to Movie Zombies. Everybody say Zombie Way. Zombies. Somebody asked if we're going to be showing zombie movies. We are. I'm going to tell you about one in just a minute. Basically, this program is born out of the idea that there are lots and lots and lots of people at Cornerstone who love action movies. Who love horror movies. And who get to talk about it at church all the time. Yeah, no, we know that doesn't happen. And that's, and that's a problem. When our culture is all about me trying to convert you to my personal taste and vice versa, there's a lot that goes undiscussed. We're here to celebrate what we love and pursue it in, in, in a way that we can determine is godly. And to pursue the questions uh, that some of this great art raises. Because the films that we choose for this event, in their own way, really are great. And they are important. And a lot of them have been around for forever. We show a lot of cult classics here. Uh, and I try to go out of my way to find movies for you guys that you have either never heard of or will certainly never get to see at your church. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, uh, this in, in, in encourages you because um, even though we're not having any seminars during the day, I am going to be doing some introductions here and I am going to be doing some uh, uh, discussion afterwards. And uh, let me give you a little tip on what we're uh, up to uh, every night. We are going to have giveaways every single night. And we'll be having our drawing for this one right after uh, Troll 2. Um, so sit tight. Um, and then we're going to be showing a movie called Best Worst Movie, which I'll tell you a little bit about uh, in a little bit um, in, the, in the notes for tonight. But then we're going to start on what's called the Real Life, R-E-A-L, slash Real Life, R-E-E-L, Urban Legend Series. Anybody know what Urban Legend is? No. Okay. Movies are a big part of the mechanism by which we spread these ideas of the urban legend through our society. And we're going to be picking on three very uh, good movies to talk about that. The first one is the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, the next one is uh, on Friday we're going to have a double feature. It's going to be Cropsy, uh, which has gotten a lot of buzz on the internet and really done well at a lot of festivals. It's about the Staten Island uh, uh, killer uh, who was this is supposedly an escaped maniac from one of the many abandoned mental hospitals in the Staten Island area. And the uh, trouble is they actually found the urban legend and they, this guy that, had, you know, they think anyway, killed a few people and they put him on trial. But how much did the urban legend inform the investigation and the trial and, the, and, and, all, and public opinion? And, and how much of it was based on actual evidence. And what are the problems when urban legends begin to creep into uh, and inform the way that we interact with each other and, 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 and the world and then setting even public policy and stuff. And then we're gonna follow that up with a movie called House of the Devil, which is a new horror movie. Who has seen House of the Devil? I'm really excited to bring this movie to Cornerstone. Does anybody know the term satanic panic? Yes. Okay, put short, satanic panic is when Everybody started to believe that there was a vast underground satanic conspiracy involving thousands and thousands of people, many of whom were in our government and our military. And they basically ran the world from underneath all the social institutions that we have. And that the thousands of children that we know disappear every year, well, you know what happens to them? They're being kidnapped by the Satanists and they're being sacrificed. Isn't that great? But that's what a lot of people really believed. And of course what happened is the FBI got involved and they couldn't find any evidence of this and then all these other institutions got involved and couldn't find any evidence of this. And then we started finding out that a lot of the people that said that they were occultists and had done a lot of this stuff were full of baloney. They were liars, they were frauds, they were hoaxers, they were making tons of money. And they weren't worth our trust and the whole thing sort of collapsed in on itself. Well, here is a movie that takes the satanic panic conspiracy movement and all the ideas that surround it and repositions it as what it always was. One whopping good campfire story. Urban legend. And in this case, really intense, fun, 
horror movie. And so that's going to kind of balance out Cropsy. After that, uh, and I got a surprise for you. Who here has seen Ricky O story Ricky? We're always going to have an action movie at Cornerstone. Always. Ricky O is a bit of a cheat because Ricky O is has special effects that look like they were done by a 12 year old. We could almost really show it for Bad Movie Night instead. Um, you're going to love it. Ricky O will change your life. Uh, it's like a funny it. It's, uh, movie. it's sort of indescribable. And I feel itchy as I sit here and try to think about ways to describe it. So I'm going to stop. But after that, um, we're going to have a zombie movie. Because I realized you idiot, you need to program movie zombies and now everybody thinks it's not about the zombie movies. <laughs> so we're going to show a movie I've always wanted to show at Cornerstone. It's called Fido. Yeah! The story is that a corporation has helped the United States government to stop the zombie apocalypse in the 1950s. They created green zones, and they created domestication collars that render the zombies harmless. So they can be milkmen, and houseboys, and companions. I'm not going to go any further with that. <laughs> but the idea here is that a one boy, Timmy, yes, he sort of adopts the family zombie as a pet. You know, how are you, Fido? Oh! And, uh, of course, we know that uh, as technology is wont to do, it starts to fail the good people of the uh, Green Zone, and the zombies start to run amok in 1950s America. It is really one of the funniest zombie comedies uh, in the last 10 years, and I know it's not on the program, but we are close-up film, and I hope you enjoy it. A um, couple of things. One is, when we draw the prizes, uh, you may notice our prizes aren't very Christian. If, if you feel they aren't Christian enough, I brought a stamp pad, and I have a stamp pad, I have a Christian fish, <laughs> or I can just stamp it with the word God, <laughs> if that helps you. Uh, another thing is, we're going to raffle off, over the next three nights, uh, a series of Cornerstone coffee mugs. Coffee zombies. <laughs> coffee zombies. Coffee zombies. Coffee zombies. And uh, these generally cost 15 bucks. You get what? Are these three refills or refills for a quarter? Great on these work. At the gallery. Both. Uh, what? Both. Quarter. So they're pretty good buy. Uh, basically, chip in a buck. We're hoping to get 15 bucks a piece on these things so we can make our money back on them. And uh, you get a mug. From, somebody's going to get a mug for a buck. So, um, Look at my mug, you tell I need the dough. So, here we go. Ah, ah, ah. Here is my notes for tonight. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the films we're going to be watching and uh, putting together a little bit of food for thought for the discussion that we're going to be having afterwards. Who here has never taken part in a film discussion? You know what? Do yourself a favor and stick around. This stuff is all, I'm going to take this out. This stuff is a lot more thoughtful than you would think. Um, and people's love for it is a lot more thoughtful than you would think. And I think you'll find that because we have great discussions at Cornerstone. Um, a little bit of history. Bad Movie Night at Cornerstone started because uh, I was really, really angry. Uh, we had finished the tent a day ahead of time, which meant that I got the rest. But no. A bunch of imaginary people just had to beg me to show a movie, and they begged and begged and begged, and I just, I was in the clutch about it, and I thought, yeah. And I went to Walmart, and I bought the movie Frogs. <laughs> I thought, I'll show these bozos. I'm going to find the worst stinking movie I could find and make them watch it, and they're going to keep me forever. <laughs> Not really. I thought we'd probably have some fun, and we did. A traditionally born corner so called Bad Movie Nights. And since then, we've watched Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster, Robot Monster, a lot of monsters at Corner Stone, uh, Kingdom of the Spiders, Empire of the Ants. Okay, here's a, here's a prover Night of the Lepus. If you weren't here, oh, it sucks to be you. Uh, Flash Gordon. A bad movie night we had at Corner Stone. Um, so needless to say, we've had a lot of fun with the concept. Tonight, we have a real treat. 
we are going to be watching a movie that makes all those other movies look like Gone with the Wind. <laughs> this movie was titled Troll 2, so they could capitalize on the minor success of Troll. But it wasn't made by the makers of Troll. It has nothing to do with trolls. There are no trolls in it. The plot doesn't have anything to do with trolls. They stole it! And they weren't even Americans. <laughs> this was directed and written by Claudio Fragasso and his wife, Rosanna Drudi. And uh, as you can imagine, they did not speak English. So what did they do? They went out and hired an American cast. And then demanded that they speak the language written into the script, which was not written by people who knew how to speak English. Verbatim. <laughs> so, you get uh, already bad actors reading a very bad script, but it's verbatim. So it's really amazing. To give you some idea of how bad this movie is, the plot involves a little boy, his family, the ghost of his dead grandfather, and vegetarian goblins who turn people into vegetables so they can eat them. <laughs> The movie also contains the single worst performance by an actress in a leading role in film history. And the second worst performance by an actress in a leading role in film history. And a bologna sandwich. <laughs> if I had been smart, I would have told you all to bring, to bring bologna sandwiches. But we'll have the Rocky Horror of this one some other time. It also has the greatest use of popcorn in the history of film. This is even better than a, a real genius where Mel Kilmer like, killed an entire house full of popcorn. This is gonna, this is really gonna change your life. Now after this, we're gonna watch a movie that's really near and dear to my heart. Uh, it's called Best Worst Movie. It's a documentary. It's made by the child star of Troll 2 20 years later when he is having to deal with the fact that he's getting calls night and day begging him for autographs for this movie that he desperately wishes he'd never made. And so are all the other cast members who are dentists and homemakers and basically just want to forget that they were ever in this movie as well. And what emerges is a really human and wonderful portrait. A real cool reminder that the people were watching up on screen and making fun of her people. And uh, I, I just think you're really going to be touched by the sense of community that emerges from watching these two films back to back together. And I hope you really enjoy them. Um, the discussion topic tonight, I just want to say some things about. I'm going to be doing this each night. So it sort of primes you as you're watching the movies to maybe kind of gear up in your thinking what we're going to be talking about afterwards. And it's called Christian Geeks in an Age of Excess. Any Christian Geeks out there? In an age where we have the cinematic world at our fingertips, and where any cherished remnant of popular culture from our childhood, no matter how obscure, is available on eBay, the 800-pound gorilla in the room is why on earth are we watching Troll 2? <laughs> a conservative neighbor of mine once said, "What you caught me watching Evil Dead 2. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Which implies, of course, that there are far better ways that I can be spending my time. Yet it's the answer to that question that I think unlocks something very important and grand. That bad movies, John reflects, and other offbeat cultural associations have brought to me, made me think about, and made me richer for having experienced through all the excess of human sin and failure surrounding me, emanating from me everywhere I go, whether I'm at the uh, church or whether I'm at the movies, God is there. And God, anywhere he is, he brings truth. And wherever God brings his truth, he nurtures community and connection between himself and others and between people. Excess. Where is excess in film in our culture? 
Anybody see this? I'm going to cut these off. Excess in culture. Is it a movie zombies? Is it on the screen? Is it sex? Is it violence? I don't like this idea of hazardous materials. It doesn't imply caution. It implies poison. Absolute no-no. Stay away. Sex and violence get an inordinate amount of blame in our culture. And the idea is that we should simply not look at anything that's unpleasant or that might have a sexual component. i got to tell you, God's grace tells me differently. Particularly as to film, and particularly in the context of adults watching film, and I think there's a whole host of, 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 of issues surrounding the way the films are marketed and distributed in the United States. And I don't like to see the young prey after the, the remarkably young. And I don't like the fact that we don't nurture a thoughtful society when it comes to film. And that we draw these simplistic, you know, you know, hazardous waste type signs for everybody. And so we leave it at that. That's lazy. And it doesn't show a lot of love for people or concern for people. Don't stumble yourself and don't stumble others. Don't let the world spoil your faith. Those are the basic scriptural commands given to us regarding culture. But it also says in the Bible to work out my faith with fear and trembling. And I have to ask, can God really be with me as I seek out some measure of understanding about my broken, sinful self as I encounter it in the arts? And even if he can, what does that have to do with an absolute piece of dreck like Troll 2? Is it reasonable to expect to get anything out of watching Troll 2? Should I watch something more highbrow or better made or socially relevant? Like flywheel. Isn't excess in our culture marked most firmly by the fact that people would rather watch Troll 2 than Bergman or Fellini or Rosalini or Macaroni? I don't think it is. It's marked by the strident reaching out towards culture to provide what culture can only point to. That is what cuts across all cultural divides high and low. The world is full of great TV and movies. Reality shows so like So You Think You Can Dance and American Idol and America's Got Talent remind us constantly of the gulf between our dreams and the reality that we can't dance. <laughs> Nobody idolizes us. And we don't have talent. Culture has become the destination for our desires. Turning women into either saints or harlots. The band-aid for our seared social conscience uh, feeding us information that should empower us to feed the world and not just the box office. An anesthetic for those who are too afraid to dream lest their dreams awaken them to action or to the economy of eternity. It is a simple law of spiritual physics that culture cannot be our only or even our primary connection to God, to truth, or to community. No collection of comics or action figures or movies can be big enough. No degree of access to the cutting edge of what's cool now can be fast enough or increase the number of hours in a day or change the fact that someday we will die. No convention or sporting event can be long enough. Culture facilitates connection through feeling and hearing but it cannot live our lives for us. Sometimes, movies are at their most powerful when they are at their least pretentious. Troll 2 is a great film because it is a film so awful that it could easily have been made by us. Who would not be proud to have such a remarkable failure attached to their resume? Who would not have had a blast making it? <coughs> now is when we recognize that even from man's worst cinematic efforts can come laughter, community, humility. Suddenly we are able to face the awful truth of our own ineptitude with a lightness of heart and the realization that our lives were never going to be about starring in our own anything. God has a higher purpose for us than wealth, fame, power, or even competence.
he's glorified by the things that others call foolish. Like making bad art, especially when we try our very best and make bad art anyway. Or watching bad movies and laughing at man's best efforts gone awry. Suddenly we are free not to be some wished version of ourselves, but simply ourselves. Our cultural conversation no longer limited to trying to convert one another to personal tastes and opinions, but simply enjoying together a moment of affirming celebration. Such simple human moments may come and go, but they offer graces far more substantial than they are given credit for. Maybe 20 years from now, no one will watch Troll 2. But I hope you'll remember this night and remember each other, even if you don't remember the movie's title.